Keegan, good morning and uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, if you could just please tell us a little about yourself, your, your, your upbringing, your background and where you come from. I was born and raised in Peter Maritzburg, a family of five. I'm the baby of uh, three boys, the youngest of three boys. But my parents had been going to church for a few years before I was. And my mum would, would invite me to church. You know, she'd say, you know, come and see what God is doing and so on. And so the one Wednesday evening, um, I decided, I say I decided, uh, to visit the church my mum was talking about. And I went there and the pastor preached the message called, um, something is missing. You know, you've been here, you've been there, but something is missing. Uh, and basically sharing the gospel, Jesus is missing. So it wasn't the kind of message that, okay, uh, you know, life is going well, all you need is Jesus. It's no, you're a sinner, you know, and therefore you need Jesus. And I knew that I was a sinner. And so I had responded to the gospel that night. That was back in 2005 at the age of 19. Now the type of church that was, if I can go into it at this point, yes. uh, I would say was a hyper-charismatic word of faith church. You know, and so as a young believer, you pretty much believe what your leaders teach you. Yes. You know, I didn't know very much. Um, I was, let's say, born again under their ministry, and God had genuinely changed my life. You know, I went from hopelessness, being a sinner, to having a love for God, a love for His Word, which I didn't have before. You know, it was a genuine conversion experience. But many of the teachings later on I realized uh, were not sound. Okay. So we just want to go back to those teachings. What were some of those teachings? Just maybe the top three or two that you remember. Sure. So I said it was a word of faith church. And so the emphasis was very much on financial prosperity. You know, uh, it got to a point where uh, Jesus was rich, the apostles were rich, and therefore God wants you rich. And looking back, many of the verses used to support such claims were taken out of context. Okay. Can you perhaps give us some of the practices then that, that then come out of this idea that Jesus was rich? What sort of mindset did it produce? We are sons of the king, you know, therefore you need to live this fancy life in a, in a sense. Uh, you need to live comfortably. Uh, we all wore our best for service. Um, you know, you're taught to claim your BMW, claim your Mercedes, claim your mansion, and so on. And so. Again, looking back, it leads very, very much, I would say, to covetousness, where you're wanting what you don't have, wanting what others have, you know. So that, that, pros that material prosperity then becomes almost an indicator of your righteousness and your closeness to God. Correct. So if, you're not, if you are not prospering, you either lack faith or there's sin in your life. Now, that's, let's say, in the extreme versions of it. Yes. Uh, but I know that's pretty much what some people actually teach. Yeah, so what you're basically saying is that even if it was not taught from the pulpit, it was certainly implied. Yes. Okay, so then you'd be treated with that sort of, almost like a leper almost, if, <laughs> if you're yes. not materially prosperous. Yeah. Sure. I can imagine that that creates almost like a, you know, a dissonance of source I mean, in a young believer. And yes, true, not just a, a young believer. Uh, I can share a story of a good friend of mine. Um, I knew him very well. We prayed together, we fellowshiped together. He, he was a sincere Christian, he was a good guy. But he went through a difficult time where I think he had lost his job. He felt he wasn't progressing as uh, other people were and certainly not the way it was preached from the pulpit that God wants you rich, God wants to bless you and so on. And he just wasn't experiencing that. And I know that he went through a, a very rough time spiritually. We could say that at that point he had a crisis of faith, yeah. you know, where he, he went through, he, he was down, he was depressed, he couldn't understand why is it that everyone else is getting ahead except him. Cool. And yet I knew him, he was a sincere guy, you know, he, he, really, he really loved the Lord. So, in these Word of, Church, Word of Faith churches, one of the things that has a strong emphasis is, you know, the blessing of Abraham. Now, in your opinion, if you would just give us their understanding 
of what the blessing of Abraham is and a biblical understanding of what the blessing of Abraham is. Sure. So the idea of the blessing of Abraham is a combination of verses from the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. So starting from Galatians chapter 3, 13 to 14, where Paul says, uh, for Christ became, Christ became a curse for us. Let me read it. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's pause there. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. But the idea of the blessing of Abraham coming upon, let's say, Gentiles or believers in Christ now, comes from Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. So the argument goes like this. Here Paul explicitly says that the blessing of Abraham might come on, on the Gentiles. And so thinking back, blessing of Abraham, well, Genesis 12, when God calls Abraham and makes the covenant with him, and God says, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. You know, kind of taking the word blessing, Galatians, blessing, Genesis 12. Okay, maybe there's something going on there. And in, in Genesis chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Now Abraham, or Abram, was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold, or livestock, silver, and gold. And so they therefore conclude that the blessing of Abraham that Paul is talking about is wealth. God promised Abraham, I'll bless you. Genesis 13, he's very rich. Galatians 3, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Therefore, God is promising wealth to those who believe in Jesus. Obviously, you know, then you, if you believe this, then it follows that you would also be rich. Um, our society is structured in such a way that there are very few very wealthy individuals. Now, if this is what we believe, uh, and our reality is different, doesn't it then follow that we should be questioning what we are being taught? Wasn't there a time where people actually questioned this reality? Sadly not. Because for many, they believe this is God's will for them. And so whether you don't see it now in your life, they still believe it to be true that this is God's will for me, and one day it will happen. But in the meantime, if it's not happening, um, more often than not, the individual is blamed for it. Hmm. Either you lack faith or you, there's sin in your life or something like that. And with that, would you say there was more of a focus on then material prosperity versus character, or were there instances where there was a balance? I think more often there's an imbalance. The focus is more on the prosperity. But I don't think it's always the case, where in some churches and some pastors, they really love the Lord. You know, the people in the congregation really love the Lord. And so sometimes there is the balance between the financial prosperity and the character, you know, living a righteous life, uh, walking in forgiveness, love, and so on. The focus is not always living a righteous life because that's what God, God's will is, but more live a righteous life so that you can be blessed. Okay, so Keegan, if you then could give us a biblical understanding of the blessing of Abraham. Sure. One of the main keys to interpreting the Bible is context. Now, context simply refers to uh, what was said before, what was said after, you know, what's the, the chapter about, what's the book about, and what does the rest of Scripture say about the topic. Now, if we look at Galatians chapter 3, you'll notice there that Paul is talking about being justified by the law versus being justified by faith. And it's in that context that he brings Abraham in. And so you'll notice all the way, uh, let's pick up maybe verse 6, where um, he quotes from Genesis 15 verse 6, where it says, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So you notice, uh, firstly, that Paul is picking up on the fact that Abraham was justified by faith, not by works of the law. But notice verse 7 uh, through to 9. It says, Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And God, pardon me, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. 
Now, I think the key to understanding what Paul was saying in verse 14 about the blessing of Abraham coming upon the Gentiles is found right here in Galatians chapter 3, uh, where Paul says in verse 8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's his key idea. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So what is that blessing he's talking about? Justification by faith. You know, it's got nothing to do with Abraham's wealth here. Even if you look at verse 14 where it says, uh, you know, Christ became a curse uh, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Notice there the emphasis is on faith. Abraham was justified by faith and we who believe in Jesus Christ are likewise justified by faith. So Keegan, there's this idea in the Word of Faith movement that as a Christian, as a child of a king, you must always be walking in victory. Can you just basically tell us a little about that? Yeah, so uh, the focus is usually on the positive verses, like uh, we are more than conquerors in Christ. Uh, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heaven, heavenly realms and so on. 3 John verse 2, Beloved, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth, <laughs> King James Version. Uh, but the focus is very much on these positive verses uh, that speak about uh, doing well, being victorious, being an overcomer, and so on. But usually those verses are taken out of context, where if you read them in context, uh, they are not talking about always doing well, being happy and prosperous. You know, many times it's overcoming persecution you know, trials and tribulations and so on. So then someone comes and says, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong that people are in a positive mindset? Isn't that how we should be? After all, all productive people have a sense of positivity. What do you say to someone who says that? There's certainly nothing wrong with being positive. You know, none of us like to be around someone who's always negative and complaining and fearful and so on. So there's nothing wrong with being positive, but often they take it too far to the extreme, you know, where everything must always go well, and such that you find some key scriptures are often left out. You know, I often say that uh, at the heart of discipleship, according to Jesus, is self-denial. If anyone wants to come after me, let him take up his cross, you know, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And that, more often than not, is missing from the prosperity gospel. That extreme would be then, you know, the power of your thoughts, positive confession. Do you know anything about that and how it plays out in these churches? Sure, I know a little and have had some experience with it, where this is what I believe to be true. It goes along with this idea that believers are gods, you know, and such that as gods, you can create your world through the thoughts you think and the words you speak. So through positive thinking and positive confession, uh, you can actually create wealth, you can create health, you can create happiness and so on. So you can think positive and you'll receive positive. You speak uh, positive and you receive positive. But the opposite is also true. If you think negative, you attract negative. If you speak negative, you attract negative. So if you say, oh, I'm sick today, or something like that, uh, you're actually speaking sickness over yourself. Oh, I don't have enough money today, or something like that. You're speaking uh, poverty over yourself. So that it almost creates a superstitious Christian. <laughs> yes, I would say in some ways that's true. And so again, just to say there's nothing wrong with thinking positive and speaking positive. Like I said earlier, we don't like, like to be around negative people. But they take it to such an extreme that uh, you have creative power in your thoughts and your words. Mm -hmm. So just like in the beginning, God said and it was, uh, you can say and it will be. It's speaking things into existence. It seems as if in these movements, God is obsessed with our earthly comfort. And then since that is the case, there should be a theological basis for that belief system. You know, in what are some of the verses that they use to justify this idea and that belief system? Perhaps we could start with this idea that you can um, create things through the thoughts you, you think and the words you speak. So one of the favorite verses, and I'm going to use the King James Version here, 
uh, to support the, the idea that you can speak things into existence comes from uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Now, you may have heard it being uh, said popularly, um, call those things that are not as though they are. I don't know if, you, if you've ever heard of that before. But that basically comes from Romans chapter 4, verse 17, where it says, <clears throat> As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I was quoting the King James Version. But basically, this is where they get the idea from, that you can call those things that are not as though they are. Now, I said... Um, one of the keys to interpreting scripture is context. Now, when you read the context, you'll notice that Paul is not saying that he can do this, or he's not even encouraging believers that they can do this. But notice what he says. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So who's the, who's the one who can call... Uh, who can give life to the dead and call those things that are not as though they were. It's God. God. So they, it's taking something that God is said to be able to do and attributing it to the believer, that now you can do that as well. But in context, it's God who calls those things that are not as though they are. Uh, and that's, that's a frightening idea. It puts the believer in a, on a slippery slope. Yes. Because then it, it gives to them almost like a godlikeness. And uh, if that confession really worked, then the world would be a different place because we could recreate it, you know, to what we desire. Yes. Yeah. So when you believe that you can call things into existence, speak those things as though they, that are not as though they are, you're actually taking something that Scripture is saying that God can do and applying it to yourself, putting yourself, in a sense, in the position of God. And uh, what are some other examples, you know, which form a theological basis for what, well, as far as they are concerned, for some of their beliefs, things like sit sewing or whatever else comes to mind. Scriptures that are used in these movements to justify their belief system. In seed sewing? In anything. In anything that you saw and you thought, you know what, this is not what the Bible is actually saying. But then they push as, as a correct interpretation. So just to say that an, another verse that people often use to support this idea that you can speak things into existence is from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, where it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will, uh, will eat its fruit. Now, I said earlier that the key to interpreting the Bible is context. One of the, the difficulties with the Proverbs is that often there isn't a context. You know, these proverbs kind of stand alone. And so it's really difficult to understand, okay, what exactly is this proverb trying to say? So in this case, there isn't really an immediate context to help us to understand what the proverb means, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, one preacher uh, took it so far as to say that you choose when you live and you choose when you die. Through your tongue, you know, you can speak the death over your life or you can speak life over your life. You know, again, taking something that God is said to do. He's in control of life and applying it to you as the believer. But if you just look at uh, Proverbs chapter 18, now there are kind of, some Proverbs are related and some are kind of random. But you'll notice that before chapter verse 21, he says a few things about words, which may help us to understand what he means in verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18 verse 4, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Verse 6. A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. Verse 8. No, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Verse 8. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body and so on. But then you come to verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I think the proverb is not saying that you have creative power in, in your words or, you know, in your, or in your tongue, but simply saying um, the words you speak have an effect, you know, for good or for bad. You know, if you come back to uh, verse 6, a fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. 
you know, you could say maybe that's somehow related. Death and life on the power of the tongue. If you're going to be foolish and be careless with your words, you can actually get yourself into a lot of trouble there. Something like that. I think what you've just done now is incredibly important. So with that, I would like you to perhaps give us some tips on accurately, you know, the correct way of reading the Bible. Number one, context, context, context. Very often we read the Bible as if it's just a random collection of verses. You know, take pick a verse there, pick a verse there. They seem to say the same thing. You put the two together and you form a doctrine. The key to interpreting scripture is reading the Bible in context. Pay attention to what's said before. Pay attention to what's said after. You know, we do that in everyday, in everyday life. Uh, we all hate to be quoted out of context. You know, uh, you and your friend are having a conversation and someone else walks in and overhears part of your conversation and they go on and quote you to someone else and then it comes back to you, oh, uh, you said this and that. And you stop and you say, hold on, maybe that's what I said, but that's certainly not what I meant. You know, you've taken what I said out of context. You know, if you were there and you heard the whole story, then you would have gotten what I, what I meant. True. And the same is true with scripture, where often we take a verse out of context and we don't pay attention to what was said before, what was said after, and really, what is the point of this passage? One of the other concerns is the times we are in. And would you say then the Word of Faith movement is also a reflection of the times we are in as the Church of, of Jesus Christ. And I'm saying this purely because as we speak, one scripture that keeps coming to mind is 2 Timothy 3, where Paul warns Timothy, and he almost prepares him and says, these are the times we are about to face. Do you think that part of the world of word of faith movement and obsession with earthly comfort and wealth and, and covetousness and a love for money and ethical come. Do you think it's it's a part of that one that Paul gave to Timothy? Certainly. You know, Paul says in the last days people will be lovers of pleasure, uh, lovers of self, rather than lovers of God. And within this type of teaching, um, that's true. You know, people are lovers, lovers of self, uh, lovers of pleasure. And what, what some, many, what many don't realize is that Jesus actually warned against the dangers of wealth and riches, where wealth and riches actually has the potential to take your heart away from God. You know, Jesus says, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But we've forgotten verses like that, you know. And his reason, besides uh, it being destroyed, you know, corruptible, temporary, he also goes on to say that for where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. So if your treasure is on earth, in earthly things, that's where your heart is going to be. If your treasure is in heaven, you know, in God, that's where your heart is going to be. So it actually has the potential to draw your heart away from God. So then the tragedy is you are getting churches that are started in the name of Jesus, but almost teach an anti-gospel message, almost teach the exact opposite of what Jesus taught. And that's true. There are foundational, let's say, teachings of Jesus in terms of what is true Christianity, what is true discipleship, and those things are either ignored or totally lost in the prosperity gospel, you know, this focus on doing well, prospering, living victoriously, uh, Jesus never promised those things. Yes, he promised that uh, our needs would be met, but he certainly did, didn't promise us comfort. He says, in the world you'll have trouble, uh, you'll be persecuted, and so on. Now, in the South African context, you have a lot of people that then say, um, we are grappling with injustices of the past, so there is an imbalance socioeconomically. Um, and then they would accuse people like you of being anti, you know, the development of people that are seen as, in some parts, I don't want to use the word previously, you know, disenfranchised, that may in some instances still be the poor and come from, you know, 
So how do you, how do you then answer to that? So I personally am not against people doing well. I'm not against people progressing, developing, uh, coming out of poverty, um, or anything like that. What I'm against is the extremes of the prosperity gospel, where your main focus now is on money, you know, rather than God. Or if it is God in, in the mix there, it's, it's just to get from God, you know. And so you take something like giving, which is a biblical principle, you know, you give to help people. Uh, that's kind of been turned on its head, where it's no longer giving to help people, giving to meet a need, it's almost giving to get. So I'm not against people doing well, uh, developing. Uh, I'm not against God's blessing. I've experienced it myself. I just don't think that the prosperity emphasis is a biblical emphasis. So another example where verses are taken out of context is like on the idea that um, you can create things through positive thinking. So you may have heard it said, uh, as a man thinks, so is he. You know, and they get that, they support the idea that you can uh, create things through positive thinking with verses like that. But even that verse from Proverbs 23 is taken out of context. Because firstly, uh, Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so you've got to ask yourself, who's the he? You know, it's a, not a gentle statement. As a person thinks in their heart, so are they. It's a specific, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And so when you look at the context, verse 6 to 8, you see that Solomon is giving some wise advice about not eating from a stingy person. You know, eat and drink, he says, but he's not, his heart is not with you, or inwardly, inwardly is calculating. Yeah, look at how much this guy is eating, you know. And so he says, no, eat and drink, you know, have more, have more. But inside, he's kind of doing it grudgingly because he's a stingy person. And so Solomon says, don't do it, you know, don't eat from a person like that. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, outwardly saying, eat and drink, have more, you know, have more. But in his heart, he's saying, oh, look at this guy, how much he's eating, <laughs> you know. Uh, so that's another example of where a verse is taken out of context. Any other example that you can think of, of how verses are taken out of context? So we've already seen that in Galatians chapter 3, clearly when Paul said that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that he was talking about the blessing of Abraham being justified by faith. Now, Peter even confirms that in the book of Acts chapter 3. I'd like to read a few verses for you. So in Genesis 12, God's promise to Abraham or the Abrahamic covenant was, you know, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. You'll be the father, the father of many nations and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so that's where they get this idea that, uh, of blessing, the blessing of Abraham in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. But I want you to notice now how Peter understands what God meant when he said, in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. So this is Acts chapter 3, I'll read from verse 25. It's Peter speaking to the Jews. He says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with, with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. Notice he's quoting from Genesis there. God, having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. But notice this. In you, pardon me, in your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. God sent Jesus to bless you by turning you away from your wickedness. So notice here, Peter himself is not understanding this blessing in terms of prosperity and wealth. He's understanding it in terms of uh, salvation, being turned away from your sins. Also, if you read uh, Romans chapter four, there as well, you see clearly that these promises to Abraham, that you'll be the father of many nations, in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. In Romans four and Galatians three, the idea is, is the same. What Paul is picking up is the fact that Abraham was justified by faith. Genesis 15 and 6, and Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And you'll, you'll find in Romans chapter 4 and Galatians chapter, chapter 3, uh, Paul is quoting that verse. You know, uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And Paul actually says in Romans 4, those words weren't, weren't written for Abraham only, but also for us who believe in Jesus Christ. Our faith will also be counted to us as righteousness. What has your interaction been like with some of the process, if any? within the World of Faith movement. 
when you confront them with some of these truths. So sadly, many of these churches are independent churches. And so the pastor is pretty much the final authority. And so when they are confronted with these teachings, in most cases, they are unwilling to change or admit that they are wrong. And so it's either their way or the highway. You know, often they'll tell you, if you disagree, you're free to leave the church. That said, and I take it that was also part of your personal experience. Yes. That you had to make that decision to then leave. So what do you say to someone in a similar situation who's finding that what's being taught and what they're reading in the Bible doesn't line up? Yes, yeah, so I, I went through an experience like that, where uh, the first church I attended when I, when I became a Christian was a Word of Faith church. But slowly, as I began growing as a Christian, reading the Bible uh, through prayer, I began to see things differently, where very often what I was reading in Scripture in context and what was preached from the pulpit uh, weren't lining up. And so I had to come to a point where I either had to stay and submit to the teaching or leave because it was a, the type of church where it was the pastor's way or there's the door. You know, they weren't open to uh, talking about it, reasoning about it. Um, they just believed this is what God is saying. Um, we believe it to be true. You're the one who's wrong. And so I went through a bit of a crisis of faith where I began to question, not, not my relationship with God. I mean, I love the Lord. I was genuinely born again. But I went through a very difficult time now because wondering, okay, what then is true? You know, is there a right way and a wrong way to, to interpret the Bible? You know, am I getting it wrong? You know, what am I doing wrong? How is it? This is clear to me, you know, and I'm reading the scriptures. This is clear to me. This is what God is saying. Yet the opposite is being preached. And so it took me a while, but I finally came out of it and had to realize that uh, pastors come and go. Teachers come and go but it's the Word of God that remains. And so I decided through my reading of Scripture that I think I'm going to go with what I'm seeing the Scriptures are saying.